right now we have with us another young Indian, part of the Voice of the Young series. Hello, everyone. Good to be back. Uh, right now we have with us Bharat Ramchandran. Let's listen to him. Over to you, Bharat. Thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Subhad Mathur sir to give me this opportunity to express my views and my thoughts in this platform. Uh, so to give a brief introduction, uh, I have like multi, I have a diverse background. I have done my bachelor's in engineering. Then I have worked for one year in a cement related industry, but I was more inclined towards environment. So I started my preparation for Indian Forest Service. That was when I got uh, to know about the broad world and the ideas of environment and environmental policy, governance and uh, development sector as such. Then I had a brief stint in IIT Madras Research Park where I was working as an energy program associate where we were trying to make India the leader in market leader in renewable energy. But my interest, my core interest lies more in natural environment rather than the built or engineering environment or sustainability. So right now I'm in my final year of master's in water resource engineering and management. So what i feel is like uh india has taken like a long step and like my research area or my interests also lie in the area of broadly focusing on policy and governance sector with a more focus in natural resource governance and natural resource management uh as we all know like uh, when we look at developmental sector or the natural resource sector broadly it gets classified into either the science aspect of it or the social science aspect of it I feel a more holistic approach would help in solving the current climate crisis or the climate change, which is going on throughout. And it affects us in our day-to-day -day lives. Water is much more of a precious resource in which we all of we all know like what we all need water, like be it a human beings or environment or the trees and animals or be it any any living organism in this planet require water for their day-to-day -day survival. So in uh, with a specific focus in water sector, I have worked on multiple projects. One where a certain project was on an Aravalli biodiversity park, which was in Gurgaon, which uh, Hero Motor Corp under the CSR fund, they wanted to maintain that park and they were trying to give people an idea of why the park was built or what the park had value for the air and water quality of Delhi and Gurgaon, as we all know. It is uh, Delhi and Gurgaon region or NCR region as such is famous. Like it has been in the top 10 most polluted cities in the world before air pollution and even water pollution or water crisis happens in Gurgaon. So groundwater mining is banned in these areas. So Aravalli Biodiversity Park, it helped, it uh, will, it has helped in reviving or rejuvenating the groundwater level to a certain extent. And it definitely helps in purifying the air because when you have a green corridor within the heart of the city, so it helps in purifying the air and enhancing our daily health standards of life. Uh, coming to back to my research or interest uh, area, it, I broadly feel that India or like in globally, we have a lot of policies, frameworks and conventions which are present in paper. And it also has more aspirational and it talks about the things that need to be done. But when it comes to the implementation part or when it comes to program management or executing a policy or executing a program through schemes, that is where uh, uh, those, there have been few successes, but there have also been few failures or few, few shortcomings, as you can say, not just failures. So I feel more focus should be given on uh, what should be done or what can be done for properly implementing a scheme or properly implementing a policy. The major part starts in how we design a policy or how we design a scheme, whether while we do it, do we do a policy impact assessment? Or do we also look at water or do we address all these stakeholders that are involved in a project? Suppose when you look at a water supply project or if we look at a water supply project for a city, so the city might just think that they would take water from the surrounding areas and supply it to the citizens of the city because water is a fundamental right to everyone. They need to give supply water to the people of the city. But whether the source of water that they're trying to take water from, will it really uh, help in surviving the survival of the ecosystem that is present there. Like, it should not be as though they have just depleted the resource in one area and they've just shifted to another area where the people from that area, they are dependent and they have the livelihoods which are dependent in that area, but they were not, they were like forced to move out or relocate to some other place so that the citizens of the city get the water project. So 
when we look uh, though the national water policy talks about equitable use or equitable sharing or distribution of water resources so this is what i meant like when we have a policy in which like the aspirational and all of us need to require water so our basic need needs to be met but when it comes to implementation of projects when it comes to implementation or creating schemes uh, it needs to be more holistic and uh, we can we need to look at consider all these stakeholders that are present uh, I believe like my experience during the preparation of Indian Forest Service and my experience in the engineering field, like my since I have a bachelor's in engineering field, I feel like today most of the problems are addressed in a terms of a technical lens. Uh, as in like if you have a problem, like how do we solve it? Do we bring out new technology? Uh, do we just install a new software or do we bring out a new technology so that it can be solved? Suppose there is a water quality problem or if there's an air quality problem. As such, the release air pollution, if you can look at it, the, there are many issues. So major issue that comes in news, uh, it always keeps on talking about is on the stubble burning that happens in the surrounding region of Haryana and Punjab. So when we try to address it, uh, generally what all of us think is like it's a technical issue or it's like an engineering approach. We How to prevent stubble burning, we just bring out new technologies that like the happy cedar technology that was bought by Punjab Agricultural University, which just like, after you harvest the rice, you use the happy cedar technology. It just cuts the stubble and takes it out and then again replants it in the field so that you don't need to burn the stubble. Uh, but the problem is not the problem is that when we just look at something from an engineering or a technical lens, we forget about the livelihood aspect or the social aspect of it. Any solution or any problem, uh, any problem for a solution to come, that is something which is called as a spilt approach which talks about the social, political, economic, legislation, and the technical angle of it. Since only when we have a holistic approach to it by looking at all the parameters, like wh why why do the farmers do this? Why do the farmers plant rice and then they burn the stubble? It is not as though that they, they, they want to do it. They have no other option. That is why they do it. Same way, when what are the laws that are present? And why, what is the background of it? Why do they shift their cropping pattern so that they plant rice and then they extract all the groundwater and then they go for wheat? So when we approach a problem holistically in, uh, by looking at all these angles, I believe a more ca consciousness-based approach would be developed in which we would be able to bring out a truly sustainable solution, which would be able to progress further and it will be followed for years together such that the natural resources are also not harmed and people are also not harmed and it's a win-win situation which is created. Uh, so. The, uh, again, when we uh, look at it, so my uh, I also done a course on like a PG diploma of the, of, with WWAF India, uh, along with National University Delhi, National Law University Delhi, which is a PG diploma on environmental law and policy. When I went through that course, I came across the uh, environmental laws and policies as such which are present in India and some comparison of or few examples from uh, around the countries, other uh, uh, India, other parts of the world. Uh, India, as such, when you look at it, has very strong and clear environmental laws which are present. Um, so, the, the, which are lacking in few countries, as we can say, like in African region or South American countries, the law itself enables or helps the people to not follow it, or it helps for exploitation of the natural resources. But in India, the laws are present uh, and it is created in such a way uh, as, in, as such that it helps in protection and prevention of the exploitation of natural resources and to maintain a sustainable ecosystem. But uh, the major uh, part which is missing or more research area which is needed or more policy focus is needed is on the implementation of the natural resource laws and what are, what are the gaps that are present in the laws and legislation. So though, despite being from an engineering background, I feel like Everyone who is working uh, or any scientist or a hydrologist or an engineer who is working in those areas, they must also have a background or they must be given a brief idea or a background on the social uh, angle, the cultural angle and the legal angle of any project. So in that way, I feel that my, my master's degree at Teddy School of Advanced Studies in Delhi, though being a, studying a master M.Tech degree in engineering, uh, it has a broad range of subjects which includes gender and water, water law, water policy governance, and water security conflicts, which gives a perspective to a person who is from a non-social science background, or to give a perspective to a person in the science and engineering sector on the developmental issues that are present surrounding a resource or a technology. Uh, 
so uh, i feel like uh, we i would like to focus more on the natural resource governance and more on the revival of traditional indian knowledges which are present with respect to water management or natural resource governance as such when we uh, look at it the indigenous communities or the tribal communities which we call they are present in their homeland or in their places for generations together and they have a huge amount of knowledge which is locked within them which is not which is not much documented and which is not much studied with scientific rigor such that the resources can be uh, the resources can be used in a much better way and it can be safeguarded for the future as we can as we say like sustainability is nothing but what we use in today needs to be present tomorrow so that's saying in sustainability we say like what we are currently doing is we are just borrowing from the future we are not using from what we are having for our own needs so that aspect i feel would change some day and it would help all of us the basic level of environmental education i feel uh, i i would like to work in some area such that some amount of awareness creation is possible so uh, so that each and every one of us have some amount of environmental awareness or environment idea of environmental education such that it, it need not be like everyone needs to work in the environmental field to safeguard the natural resources it can be any an it professional or a politician or a normal uh, conservancy worker or a labor who's working in an industry sure. you know each and every one of them have their own knowledge of environment and a basic understanding of the environmental education they would be better placed in securing their own future and understand what happens if they do some if they do something which is a business as usual approach or if they do it something in sustainable development way approach so Uh, i also feel like this can be said as like one of the downsides of industrial development i want to say it's a failure but one of the downsides of technology and industrial development is that all of us even including me people tend to forget or understand their, uh, their environment that is present around them in olden days or in previous days the wherever we go and settle or like in our hometown the basic understanding would be we would first need to understand what is the natural resources present around us what is the trees that are present around us what are the birds that is present around us based on that our culture develops and uh, we our food habits our lifestyle is also developed but today our lifestyles are changed such as uh, such as because of industrial revolution though there have been many positives of it one thing is like uh, uh, so because of the advancements in technology logistics especially uh, and the uh, globalization as such so uh, all of us uh, don't take that initiate that effort to understand how the whole world works how the systems work so because of that the downside may be that we feel like we are getting the we are getting our products that we use in our daily life for our sustenance not for ex- extra consumption but for our daily needs whatever we need we are getting in the supermarket we are getting it from somewhere but because of lack of awareness of what happens for that to come here we fail to recognize the impact of it would be the environmental impact or the social impact or the technical impact of the products that is uh, that is used so when we have some amount of you know like if we are able to spread some amount of environmental <clears throat> awareness or education to people surrounding uh, in the world like anyone be it anyone so they would make an informed choice so when we make, when we make an informed choice i believe uh, the change happens at home or change happens with ourselves so one example i can tell about is like uh, though i had been talking about like spreading awareness on environment and i talk with my friends and all those things so uh one of my friend he introduced me to cycling as a hobby yeah. so after so after that uh, what happened was i initially thought of it as just an activity like instead of going to gym you just use your cycle so there's a double benefit like you uh, have you stay fit and also it's a hobby but after getting into a community of cycling that was when i realized like cycling also can be used as a mode of commute so right now uh, i bought i have a cycle with me so i use my cycle to commute to the university yeah understood there are some challenges and difficulties that are present because we have lack of infrastructure and road safety issues but i believe only when we start doing by ourselves we would and when we create a group of like minded people we would be able to demand from the public uh, sector or from the policy makers and the politicians like this is what we need so right now the world runs in a business as usual approach in which the industries produce goods and all of us are using those goods so it might be that that the, it, the products are in demand yes but 
to make it sustainable the change could will should start from the grassroots from the people so i believe a people's movement is what is needed for a change in lifestyle for sustainable development and for sustainability to be taken as a mass campaign uh, only as you can see as we had seen in the swachh bharat mission so the way of sanitation or building toilets or clean hygiene or wash sector as we call it the water sanitation and hygiene it has been in talks for a long years from i think 1970s 80s but only when it had been started as a jan andolan or a people's campaign people started to talk about it think about it and then the government also started to act on it as a mass campaign such that people are made as the custodians and people are made as the stakeholders in those uh, movements so that people spread awareness about wash sanitation and hygiene so that is uh, these are the uh, view these are my views generally in area of environmental sector or the developmental sector so my basic uh, 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 interest specifically lies in water policy as such because i feel water as a subject it is very crucial or critical for everyone in in, uh, in the country and for, in the world as such but it is like a di- very dicey situation as in water is required for everyone it is a very basic need and necessity of life but if we don't look up at it as a resource which and which needs to be looked at from a little bit of an economic angle the fresh water availability is keeping on decreasing because the population keeps on increasing and we need to give water to everyone so if we don't apply the principles of water pricing or like economic or policy perspectives to water uh, the people don't understand the necessity or value of water as can be seen in the utilities like we the water sector right now the pricing or water pricing there are there are many issues and shortcomings and there are also some good examples which have been done but the water sector needs to get transformed to such a way how electricity is being perceived by people so today people have some kind of an awareness in the energy sector like we need to save energy we need to go for water energy efficient star rating labeling and we need to be energy efficient buildings and on a personal scale also people look at their eb bills the electricity bills and they calculate and keep on like oh, how is how much is my energy consumption how can i reduce my energy consumption but when it comes to the water people feel of it as a all of us uh, feel of it as, as a right as a birth right or a legal right that we are entitled and enabled to it yeah it is true all of us are enabled and entitled to a legal right of water but since the water resource that is present in the world is same since the time the earth has formed and the population is in, is increasing and we are, all of us need equitable distribution and share of water we need to bring some amount of water efficiency and some amount of water uh, efficiency and knowledge water literacy to people so that people can uh, take informed decision and they would also be much better placed when we look at water conservation or water issue uh, when we look at industries as such they would benefit uh, when we they, they do water audits and they become water efficient since it reduces their water bill it reduces the water footprint so if they become more energy water efficient and they can use it as a label and people would be start using to use their industries use the products that the industries produce okay so why yeah so the major thing is uh, despite being from an engineering background i feel the lot of research is happening in, in when you look at academic research as such be it in hydrology or groundwater or climate change or something related to uh, water resi- or water po- policy or something academic research keeps on happening and publications and journals keeps on coming uh, but i i would like to act as an interface between the technical the ac- academic aspect of it which most of the general p- public and people don't find it very easy and hard to digest since they would need to know those terms and when we look at the other side of it there are few people or there are there are obvi- there will definitely be people who would want to do something they would want to do something good for the environment or they would want to be more sustainable or they would want to contribute in some way but they would not know what is the technical or legal aspect or how to approach it how to approach the problem or how to be more sustainable so yeah. and uh, so I, i feel like acting the more need, the need of the hour or right now urgently the need is to act as a mediator or a facilitator between the jargon heavier the technical research angle which is happening in the industry in the academia as such or the public publishers or researchers and to convert it into simple easy language is people are able to understand so that they have an impact on them and they are able to change their lifestyle so mm-hmm. that it helps the whole human kind as a whole, as a uh, whole it because as we are, as we all know 
uh, right from the starting of indus valley civilization or all the empires in history everywhere we see when people stand together or when people cooperate and understand with each other we are able to survive so we need to change and adapt and mitigate ourselves such that instead of competing with each and everyone no one is a competitor for all of us in the world all of us just needs to share and co-live in this world such yeah. that we are able to such that we are able to uh, b- bring a better future for our future generations so this these are my like basic thoughts that i wanted to share uh, with well, all of you you have certainly <laughs> Hang on. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. You have certainly given us a very passionate and detailed uh, view of your, you know, understanding of your views and what you want to do. And I'm sure you will do something with it because you are so passionate about it. And by now you have such a wide degree of uh, knowledge uh, that you can look at a problem holistically rather than simply say we should look at it because you have. engineering law environment terry is a great place to be <clears throat> so i think you are going to do something with it which will be very helpful okay so yeah. i'm certainly uh, impressed by the depth of your thinking and of course on water but just i want to add two points on water yes in india because not for you but for the viewers also yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah most of the water is used by agriculture not by households by most i mean 75 to 80% we don't have the exact yeah. data <clears throat> but yeah. it's going in agriculture not in households the households actually are not even properly supplied with water so there is a big contradiction that our water levels groundwater levels are depleting households don't get enough but agriculture uh, sucks up so much that <clears throat> we are and at one point i'm now talking of from my age long ago <laughs> nobody bothered about it because we needed to be no longer food short we were a food short mm-hmm. country when i was young yeah <clears throat> so we didn't want to be food short so if people are using up water it's fine because at least we will have food but now we are exporting rice right so there is no more a need in the country poor people are poor and that's why they don't have enough food but as such we are not food short anymore but yet the habits have become entrenched that we need to grow rice and export it and rice sucks up water you know so there is a big issue there and second that the groundwater levels are very different in different states right so mm-hmm. when we say india and the average for india it actually hides that india is a big country and that's true for almost anything that you say about india that india is a big diverse country and there are states where water like if you go to assam they don't have the water problem even in some parts of west bengal but then if you come to other states um, the groundwater level is really a problem right so we need to be a bit careful when we say that it's an all india issue because the term all india is not very clear what does it yeah. mean so i would say look we need to start talking about which are the five to seven states where water scarcity groundwater level depletion is really an issue and where it is not and whether there have been any uh, methods or procedures done by people so we need a little bit of selectivity and a little bit of uh, saying look this has worked i uh, i believe there was an experiment in what is now telangana sponsored by some international agency that look the community can come together and uh, preserve the groundwater level so we need to actually move a little bit beyond identify first of all, we need to first identify the problem more selectively and then actually start thinking what is the solution but overall i am very impressed by what you said and just want to ask you whether you want to add something more any final yeah, sir, like, view yeah yeah just as like you had mentioned the major issue or the major problem that all of us in india are not able to understand is that whenever we talk about india like when we say like india in average is this or india is like that the major thing that everyone fails to recognize is that india is such a huge and a diverse country 
whatever happens in one part of the country is not valid for other part of the country so this is also one point that i was that i found out and i want to talk, tell about is like even when it comes to the policy sector or when it comes to policy and governance or scheme uh, execution this one thing which i feel is like a little bit of a shortcoming which happens is like policies are created centrally such the uh, most some policies are created centrally some are given to the states but when policies are created centrally they fail to recognize that the cultural habits and the lifestyle of people is very very different from south to north and from east to west mm -hmm. so some amount of leeway or some amount of autonomy needs to be given to modify it so that the broad idea can be implemented in a much better way otherwise it would be lead to a lapse of policy that is happening yeah true okay well thank you bharat uh, that's very good of you to be so passionate and i'm sure mm -hmm. uh, because of your practical engineering background one day you will do something that will make it happen so let's say bye now and yeah. maybe uh, we you. will catch up with you one year from now to see where you get your job you can't be a student anymore i guess unless you do a phd <laughs> which you might who knows okay so let's say bye to the viewers bye everybody and i'll be back bye. with another young person or an expert soon okay so bye